Howdy and welcome everyone to Texas A&M's Virtual Campus Sustainability Month. Thank you for joining us again. This is our first event for this week of October 26. We're excited to have you here with us today. We have a, a great speaker here. Dr. John Nielsen Gammon is here with us today. Um, and I'll pass it over to him in just a little bit. Just gonna go over a few of the kind of the ground rules that we talk about before we start these talks. So uh, first things first, the best way to view this presentation is to turn your screen on to side-by-side -side mode. If you look at your bar on the on the right of it, there's an option to do that. So I recommend you turn that on. You can also turn on your subtitles if you'd like to view the presentation that way. Uh, we ask that you have, if you have any questions, please ask those in the chat at any time during Dr. Uh, Nielsen Gammon's talk, and we'll ask those at the end in a, in a Q and A that we'll have. And you can also use the raise your hand feature during that Q and A section at the end. Um, until that time, please keep your mics muted. And you can also, um, towards at the end during the Q&A, you can um, unmute your mic, you can turn on your video if you want it to communicate that way. We don't have a lot of people on the call. Um, in the Office of Sustainability, our Sustainability Champion Awards are actually currently open. Um, so please apply to that. We have Sustainability Champions for uh, students, faculty, and staff. And also our internship program opens today. So this is the first day that you can apply to be an intern in our Office of Sustainability. So please check that out, it's on our website. And also you can get prizes for participating. So if you pay attention during this talk, there's gonna be a code word. Um, it could be spoken, it could be uh, written on a slide, it could be dropped in the chat. Just keep track of your code words. Um, at, if you are able to uh, collect two code words, you get yourself a water bottle. If you collect three code words, you get yourself a t-shirt. If you collect five, you get a water bottle and a t-shirt. And what we ask you to do is at the very end, just email all of your questions and or all of your code words in one email to sustainability at tamley.edu. You have all the way until November 9th to do that. You have to pick up your prize on the top College Station campus. We can't ship those. And you don't have to watch these live. These are recorded, so you can go back and watch this later if you prefer. Um, so with that, I'm gonna, um, before I pass it over to Dr. Uh, John Nielsen Gammon, I just wanna read his bio. So. Uh, Dr. Nielsen Gammon grew up in Northern California, and he spent 10 years in Massachusetts, where he earned his PhD in meteorology from MIT, and he earned that in 1990. He became a faculty member uh, at Texas A&M University in 1991, and he's been here ever since. He is now the region's professor of atmos atmospheric sciences and serves as the Texas State Climatologist. He, has, he, ha he was appointed the Texas State Climatologist in 2000, and he does research and teaches on severe weather, drought monitoring, climate change, computer simulations, and air pollution meteorology. And he is a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. Uh, so Dr. Nielsen Gammon, we're so happy to have you here with us today. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you can take over when you're ready. Okay, uh, thank you. Sure, so um, yeah, as you heard, I'm in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences and um, I've been interested in weather and um, science for that matter, since um, oh, uh, growing up in California. And it's easy to get excited about the weather because uh, we can just look up at the sky and see beautiful clouds. Uh, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with Clouds that look like this, a squall line coming through. You can see some rain down there on the horizon. Things look ominous. You know, you don't see this sort of cloud every day, but um, it's something you recognize. It's something that's perfectly normal. Um, on the other hand, where I grew up, um, this is what normal clouds looked like. Um, low overcast, um, kind of foggy, uh, very indistinct pretty much the opposite of the sorts of clouds you'd see in Texas. And, you know, we are not used to the clouds that we aren't familiar with. Uh, you don't often see clouds like this in Texas. Um, this turns out to be a cloud in Boulder, Colorado, where I've spent some time. Um, it's called a lenticular cloud. And it requires a special set of circumstances to form, but you can see clouds like this very frequently in that part of the country. And when I went to school in Massachusetts, um, saw clouds that actually didn't look like this. This is some, from someplace up in the Arctic, but it's the sort of cloud you wouldn't expect to see in California, in Massachusetts, in Texas, or in Colorado for that matter. 
So that sort of begs the question about clouds. What is uh, a normal cloud? What's a normal cloud look like? And what a normal cloud looks like for each of us is based on what we've become accustomed to seeing in the sky. Uh, that's what normal is to us, but normal is not a universal normal. It's a very personal normal. Um, growing up in California, I was learned from experience what politics was like, what elections were like. A um, couple months before each state election, we would get in the mail a 50 page document they had a list of all of the ballot propositions that people were going to be voting on, plus a couple pages of arguments for and against those ballot propositions. So that everybody was acquainted with the issues and had a fair and factual account of the trade-offs. And I thought that was the normal way for uh, elections to be run, what politics worked. Um, went to Massachusetts and I found that politics was a completely different thing there. Um, Massachusetts was pretty much a one party state and something that was perfectly normal in Massachusetts but would have been completely unheard of in California is the fact that the longtime Speaker of the House uh, for the for the state House of Representatives in Massachusetts, had a brother who was a well known mobster. Kind of weird, but that was the way things worked back there. Uh, in Texas, we're familiar with a different sort of politics where um, perhaps uh, someone in Massachusetts would be kind of surprised to to learn that the uh, leader of the uh, Texas uh, State Senate is a radio commentator rather than um, a career politician. Um, one can talk for a while about whether that's better than having a brother that's a mobster. It probably is much better, but um, we think this is normal. We would not think California's elections were normal. We would not think Massachusetts is normal, but uh, that's not to say that one is necessarily better than the other. Um, we learn these norms in politics um, from what we're used to experiencing. Um, what's this have to do with um, climate and sustainability? Well, with climate, a big issue is climate change. Climate change is fundamentally a transition from the climate of the past to the climate of the future. And the climate of the past is something that we regard as normal climate. And that has lots of consequences for society and our personal relationship to climate and climate change. I'm gonna give a couple more examples of, of normal outside of the climate realm to help illustrate some of these issues. Um, what is not normal to us is often something to be feared. We actually don't know how to deal with unfamiliar situations very well compared to dealing with normal situations. So normal climate is something we're adapted to, we're used to, we don't give it a second thought, but encountering something unique and different can be scary and very difficult to deal with. If you go around the world, there are lots of different forms of transportation which are quite customary, quite common in particular locations that if you were suddenly required to use one, you might be very scared about how to do it, what might happen to you if you tried doing it, but anybody there will say, yeah, this is how it works, this is normal, there's nothing to be worried about. So for example, you might um, have a uh, ride share jitney as the common mode of transportation. Uh, you might have a motorcycle taxi. Uh, instead of having the yellow cab, you've got the yellow fenders and the and the yellow uh, uh, outer garment indicating this is a 
taxi driver who is actually somewhat regulated in providing transportation. Um, you might be scared to get a ride in a black car from an unknown driver, but black car limousine is quite common in many parts of the United States as a uh, preferred mode over taxis for those who can afford that sort of thing. Um, train travel is quite common in many parts of the world, although the way it actually works out tends to change quite a bit from place to place. Um, notice in this in the train, you're, I don't know which way it's going. If the train is actually coming toward us, I'd be worried about what the engineer would be able to see looking out the window. On the other hand, um, in the uh, driverless taxis of the future, there may be nobody looking out the window. Um, there are other forms of transportation where it's basically you take what you get. And um, this is scary to some people. It's perfectly normal in other parts of the world for, for people who are used to it. So when we're dealing with climate change, uh, psychologically, it's, it's uh, somewhat like um, you've got your normal experience of the world. Uh, maybe you're accustomed to hitchhiking. Um, and now you're being compelled to enter a new world with new norms. I don't know whether this particular hitchhiker would be willing to accept a ride from a driverless car, for example. Uh, that would be an interesting hitchhiking experience. So, um, we all grew up with a certain climate and we all grew up with a certain environment we learned about what was normal we learned about how you interact with other people uh through um our childhood our childhood experiences um i wonder if you feel like you had a normal childhood and how would you know before you met other children saw other families you probably thought that your childhood experience was the childhood experience and then our sense of normal developed in the context of what we see from, from not just other friends or classmates, but from television and so forth. So we've developed a sense of normal that could involve attitudes and emotions toward normality. So for example, what if I told you that these two children had a normal childhood? and the others didn't. Are you now looking at these children in different ways? Is there a certain child you feel you can relate to more or worse, than, better or worse than, than what you could be for from this? Do you feel sorry for the children who didn't have a normal childhood? Do you feel sorry for the children that did have a normal childhood? Well, you know, obviously that sort of characterization is somewhat unfair because in reality everybody in this picture had a different childhood and every one of you had a different childhood so while we think of our past experiences to some extent as normal it's probably better to think of it as uh, our, our our past being precious it's a unique experience that each of us had each of those experiences is valuable in its own way, and we can attach value judgments to it, being good in some senses or, or bad in others. But whether it was good or bad, it's our experience, and in at least some aspects of it, we wouldn't want anybody to take away from us. Just like the, the photographer of this camera angle has taken away um, our uh, experience of the poor child that's hidden in view behind that other child over there on the right hand side of the picture. And um, I don't know anything about the childhood of the other kid. All I know is based on the expressions of the kids next to him, he's probably got a giant wasp that just landed on the back of his neck or something like that, uh, which is somewhat normal and we can attach a value judgment to that as well. Well, we talk, talk, uh, attach a lot of value judgments to climate too, uh, but our climate experiences are quite unique also. Um, if you grew up in West Texas, you were used to this type of climate. 
um, dry, windy, um, not very many trees, uh, central Texas, uh, your experience of climate is very different. Uh, in East Texas, your experience of climate would be different also, uh, such that, you know, East Texas and West Texas, we talk about the climate of Texas, it's actually the climates of Texas. And to be fair, um, probably most of you did not grow up in either of those climates. You probably grew up in a, a climate that looks like this. Um, the plants that you saw represented climate because, as we know, climate uh, is a strong driver of plant communities. And for that matter, plant communities are a strong driver of climate also. The climate we have on the earth has changed dramatically because of the existence of plants. Um, carbon dioxide was the primary constituent of the earth's atmosphere until plants started um, and other organisms started using uh, carbon dioxide for plant material which then eventually, to some extent, got buried at the bottom of the ocean and subducted into the Earth's crust and even the Earth's mantle. So our climate has changed dramatically, even though we're used to our own normal climate. And we see that climate changing now recently at um, an unusual rate, despite the fact that climate has changed a lot in the past. Um, you know, we, this is a plot of past climate change over the globe. Global average temperatures have gone up by about a degree Celsius, which is about two degrees Fahrenheit. Um, they're projected to keep rising. We've got various projections here over the right to 2050. Their change over the next 30 years is, is likely to be as large as the change over the past 100 years or so. Um, but if we take a longer view of things, this is, this is the change over the past 11,000 years. You can't read any of the numbers, but each tick mark on the left is one degree Celsius. And compared to the past, uh, the climate change of the future is like this, this sudden right angle on the graph. The change is, is happening much faster than most changes in the past, except for perhaps some of the changes that caused mass extinctions in the past. So that climate ecosystem interaction and equilibrium that we see across Texas is being thrown completely out of whack by climate change. And uh, that's gonna have consequences for the natural environment. Uh, here are the climate trends in Texas, temperatures going up by about uh, a half to three quarter degree Fahrenheit every single decade. And that's happening throughout the state. Um, uh, summer extremes, fortunately, the, the, the hottest days of the year are not going up very, very rapidly. Um, but um, cold extremes are, are getting much warmer, which means plants which no longer could thrive at our latitude are now able to thrive. So that's going to affect ecosystems. Uh, rainfall is trending upward across most of the state, especially in central and eastern Texas, although Quite frankly, natural variability is, is a much bigger driver of rainfall variations across the state these days. Um, this is rainfall during the winter time in the 10 different climate divisions of the state of Texas. And if you grew up in the 90s or in the, nor in the uh, northern part of the state in the 2000s, you experienced very wet winters compared to what was normal over a longer period of time. So your, your perception of normal was somewhat distorted by your own unique experience of the climate. Now, our own past experience of the climate is not just a psychological thing, and it's not just an environmental thing. It's also an economic and infrastructure thing. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration came out with new estimates of the greatest amount of rain you could expect to see in one day uh, over the course of a century. And this map is showing the change compared to the previous version of this map that was produced 50 years ago. 
and the green indicates where those estimates have gone up. Now, not all of that is climate change, but there's more greens than yellows on this map. So we've got a lot of climate change impact going on here. And why do those numbers matter? Well, those numbers are input to hydrologic models which simulate how big the 100-year floodplain is. And if you've got property in the floodplain, it becomes much more difficult to develop. If your home is in the floodplain, you have to buy flood insurance, your property values are lower. So what happens when normal changes for the floodplain? Well, suddenly the house you have uh, becomes considerably less valuable and it becomes much more difficult to obtain a mortgage. So right now, hydrologists are working out the floodplains for, for these areas that have updated estimates. And that's going to have some serious consequences for uh, particular homes. If this home was no longer was used to be out of the floodplains, now in it, that's going to have economic consequences for whoever lives there. Um, depending on how financially well off they are, it could be devastating. And those devastations are going to have a different impact for this family, say, uh, than for this family. Both of these homes are in Houston, but. Uh, the economic situations are completely different. But it's, it's a case where, uh, in part, climate change has caused a gradual change in climate, but it gets experienced very suddenly and a big economic impact at the local level. We think of it as it's going to be a big cost to society, but these pocketbook issues show up as potentially devastating to individual families at various times. Now, our experience of climate change and the risk of flooding varies depending on where you are. Um, this is a plot of the wettest day of the year in a particular station in Harris County and a particular station in Brazoria County, which is just to the south. And in Harris County, um, if you're from there, you know you've gotten a lot of flooding recently, like Hurricane Harvey, for example, but also the Tax Day flood, the Memorial Day flood, all of that was in the past five years. And our estimate of the typical wettest day of the year is statistically going up. Our estimate of the, the magnitude of the event you expect to see maybe once every 100 years is going up. It's, it's gone up by about 50% over this period. But in Brazoria County, it hasn't gone up hardly at all. Uh, but if you notice, the values are much higher. Uh, there was this major rain event in in 1979, which really affected the statistics. Now, if you're in Houston, you believe, you have quite a bit of confidence that there is a big upward trend in extreme rainfall. There's no question about it. And in fact, if we apply a statistical analysis to a whole bunch of rain gauges throughout central and eastern Texas, uh, Harris County is a sort of a, a hot spot. Uh, this is our estimate of the percentage change in um, the 100-year rainfall over the past 60 years. It's taking all the data for that period and saying, well, given this, how likely was such an event in 1960 versus how likely is it now? And it's got up not just in, in, in Harris County, but in East Texas and parts of North Texas and so forth. Um, a lot of that is due to those recent events. Uh, over here on the, on the right, I have plotted uh, how the estimate of the trend has been affected by just the, a recent three years worth of data. And those three floods that I've mentioned are responsible for a large portion of our estimated trend over the past century. Uh, of course, those events were sort of bad news for um, Houston, certainly bad news for, for houses that flooded, but we have this consequence that Houston thinks that stream rainfall is increasing rapidly. And uh, we also know as climate scientists that extreme rainfall is going to be increasing because of climate change. But frankly, in Houston, their experience of extreme rainfall is even worse than climate change. It's gone up much more rapidly than you'd expect from climate change. Um, Conversely, though, in other places, such as Dallas, uh, 
they know that climate science is saying that it's supposed to increase, but they have not experienced that. There's even a few yellow dots here, which says that the long-term trend based on the historical record is for fewer extreme rainfall events. So this has two consequences for preparedness for climate change. Uh, most people are not willing to just accept abstract statements from client scientists. They know their lived experiences. They know what normal is to them. And they know that normal is changing based on the weather that's happened recently. Um, well, that means not only is Houston well prepared for climate change, they're probably actually ahead of the curve because they think, I think most people in Houston would think that climate change is going to make extreme weather even more likely than it has been recently. Whereas uh, in reality, at least based on my analysis of the situation, uh, the climate change trend will probably not catch up to what's happened there recently for another 50 years. It won't be 50 years before, uh, it's going to be 50 years before the true risk of, of extreme weather uh, catches up to the perceived risk, risk based on the bad luck they've had recently. But in Dallas, extreme rainfall should have been increasing due to climate change, but it hasn't. So already perceived risk of extreme rainfall is lower than the actual risk due to climate change. And when we say climate change is gonna increase the risk of extreme rainfall, we actually mean it's gonna increase it based upon what should have been happening now, not, not the lucky lack of flooding that has actually taken place. So in other words, their risk of extreme rainfall estimates are behind the curve already, and it'll be farther and farther behind the curve going forward. And as the inevitable floods come, as the inevitable extreme rainfall comes, people's sense of normal, people's sense of the trend due to climate change is going to change. And it's really only when those catastrophic events take place that people truly take to heart what climate change is doing to the things that matter to them, the things that affect their daily lives affect the sustainability of their households, let alone the sustainability of the planet. So your normal is not my normal. It's a precious experience that we've had. Uh, in climate, your experience, it may not be a reliable sense of what has been, what should have been normal. And unfortunately going forward, your normal will never be normal again. You're never gonna have another normal childhood. You're also never going to have the climate that you used to have. And in a sense, sustainability involves some combination of, of, of recognizing that and, and managing future climate and balancing our steps to, to reduce climate change and our steps to adapt to climate change so that we can see a viable path forward uh, with the future climate of the earth as we help to shape it. So thank you for your attention. That's my presentation on sustainability. All right, great. Thank you so much for that presentation, uh, Dr. Nielsen Gammon. That was really interesting. Uh, we have a thank you so far in the chat. If anyone has a question that they want to ask, uh, then that was a great time to get that answered. Not every day you have the state climatologist uh, on the Zoom call to answer your questions about climate change. So please put some questions in the chat. Um, before we get there, uh, I have a couple questions I can ask. So I, uh, I really like what you said at the end, um, your normal will never be normal again. I thought that was really powerful, a really interesting way to kind of think about this. And it just made me think about uh, myself growing up in Wisconsin and thinking about winters and how, you know, if we ever had winter or a big snow event in March, it was a really weird, rare occurrence. And now we'll have winter in April, winter in, in May. Um, even even yesterday it was snowing in Wisconsin. It's really early for snow. Um, so definitely not normal from what I remember. And I guess I was just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit more. Or maybe even what about you? Like what was normal for you that is no longer normal? If you wanted to maybe expound on that a little bit. Yeah. And we don't, you know, we don't know whether those sorts of experiences 
uh, that you referred to um, is is a change in climate or just the the our own limited experience of of normal um, uh, we have seen and I've seen as climatologists in Texas that the variability of, of of weather from year to year has has increased dramatically we had we had the the dry, driest water year on record back in 2011 we had the wettest year on record in 2015 and those swings have become really dramatic and if you sort of sketch out a, an envelope of um, of uh, the, the, the wettest years versus the driest years over time, um, that envelope has been getting wider and wider over the past few decades. Uh, but if you look back even farther back before we can remember anything, the envelope was wide back then also. 1917 was a ridiculously dry year. 1919 was a ridiculously wet year. Um, so uh, those experiences, um, affect us and they affect what we think the climate trend is and probably we we overestimate trends that are dramatic and underestimate the trends that we haven't noticed uh, when i came to, to college station in 1991 i wasn't familiar with the climate three years later we had a 14 inch rainstorm um, in october and um, i got figured that was the customary um, extreme rainfall event, um, even though it hasn't happened since then. And in fact, we haven't had anything that's come close to it since then. So my expectation of that is, is very different. Um, California is a weird place. Uh, the climate there really doesn't change dramatically. We don't tend to have dramatic climate events except for uh, the wildfires that you've been hearing about. Um, I was lucky enough uh, to not have experienced any of those firsthand. I had moved out of um, the Bay Area before the the Oakland firestorm uh, that happened in the in the 1980s there. So um, it is weird to be hearing about California with all these fires and the smoke when wildfire was not even on the radar except for visiting my aunt and uncle up in the in the in the Sierra Nevada mountains and knowing, yeah, a forest fire could come through. They have an evacuation plan, but they'd never been seriously threatened by anything like that. Um, so that's that's been a big perceived change for me that I fortunately haven't had to experience. Um, <clears throat> so thinking about the fires happening in California, I've heard some some of the some other talk about uh, the smoke actually possibly affecting us here in Texas. Um, have you seen anything about that or read anything about that? Well, uh, the the emissions from fires um, do you know make it around the globe. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have much of a um, uh, a wind pattern this year that's brought a lot of smoke here. But um, the fire affects air um, air quality in a couple ways. First of all, you've got all the particles of smoke, which can have these complex hydrocarbons and then get breathed in and bed in the lungs. Uh, they also tend to have a lot of carbon monoxide and, and ozone, which is which is unhealthy as well. But it's it's uh, it's order of magnitudes less dangerous than if you're there in California. Um, but um, I want to just mention uh, some, a related bit of information. There's been a lot of talk um, among uh, ecologists um, about the need for controlled burns to um, reduce the intensity and risk of fires. And I don't know the answer to this question, but I'm wondering um, how you balance the risk of controlled burns on people's health because that smoke is unhealthy to breathe, whether or not it's burned intentionally or accidentally. And, um, I could I could foresee pushback from people who who um, are subject to health risks from controlled burns who might prefer to just take their chances with wildfire if one comes along. 
All right. Yeah. Um, and I guess thinking about the the smoke and all of that, have you uh, looked into any connections between like the smoke from the wildfires and COVID-19 or how that might make, you know, that more more risky? Um, there's been a, a sort of a pile on risk of COVID-19 to, to any natural disaster because um, the when people have to evacuate, um, they're put in evacuation centers. And that required a bit of a reevaluation, for example, with Hurricane Hannah in South Texas and with the, uh, the hurricanes elsewhere and with the wildfires because you can't pile everybody up in a big gymnasium packed close together anymore. Um, it's sort of uh, been fortunate that another consequence has been the, the lack of tourism, which means there have been a lot of hotels available to put people up in temporarily and maintain social distancing. Um, I don't think there's a direct health effect, uh, except for, you know, people preferring to be indoors versus outdoors and those preferences change. Um, masks probably help reduce the amount of aerosols you're breathing in from fire. So that could potentially be a, a knockoff beneficial side effect of COVID-19 and wildfires. All right, great. Thank you for that. Um, so I think this will be our last question. We have a question in the chat. Uh, so. Uh, this person is asking, we are experiencing increasing amounts of localized flooding and heavy rain events around the state. As a certified floodplain manager, we need more extensive floodplain development regulations. Have you personally or your office worked with FEMA and the CRS program post Hurricane Harvey? Um, well, the, um, the results I showed near the end were actually a study that was uh, commissioned by the Harris County Flood Control District. Um, partly, I suppose, because they kept getting asked, are you considering climate change in your, in your uh, uh, floodplain management mitigation strategies? And so what I provided was sort of good news for them that the, the new estimates of, of heavy rain risk were going to be valid and useful for, for a few decades. Um, but it's bad news for basically every place else around the state where uh, even the updated estimates are going to be underestimates. Um, so I'm um, interested in um, trying to help um, utilize estimates of rainfall risk, consequently flood risk that change over time. The problem is there's not a well-established engineering practice way of incorporating uh, changing flood risks. And there's a couple aspects of that problem. One is you have to have a reliable way or way that everybody can buy into about saying, here's how much the risk is going to change. And that needs to be, I think, some combination of historical trend and and uh, science about projections, but the historical trend um, needs to take into account a, a a much larger geographical area than what we traditionally do for uh, extreme fundamental risk in the first place, because the statistics need to be more robust. So how you do that is one issue. The other issue is what you do with this stationary tr with this non-stationary trend. Uh, you know, it's one thing to say, okay. The 100-year floodplain right now is here. Next year is going to be here. Next year is going to be here. Well, how far out do you say this? We're going to predict the floodplain in 30 years is going to be this big, and so we're going to manage development now. We're going to manage flood risk now in that same area. We haven't really dealt with the, um, the design lifetime of floodplain management, so to speak, to say, how far out in the future should our existing infrastructure and existing regulations be resilient? Um, so that's sort of an issue I'm working with, but I, have, I haven't been working directly with floodplain managers on that issue. All right, we actually have a follow-up question out to what you just talked about. So the first uh, question is, should we be using the Atlas 14 modeling system? Well, that's the best estimate of the stationary values. Um, in terms of um, trends, at least as a first cut, you could um, you could you could infer um, 
something like what we did for, for Houston, which is um, something like a, a 10% increase in uh, extreme rainfall amounts per degree of global warming. So do you say, okay, well, we're going to warm up by another degree Celsius in the next few decades. Well, that means that we should add another 10 or 15% to the rainfall amounts. And you can always, you can always design, you know, design additional buffer of uncertainty. Even the, even the stationary estimates themselves come with a fairly wide uncertainty range. So you can actually um, couch it in terms of climate change without exposing explicitly doing so by saying, okay, we don't know what future climate is going to be. So we're going to take the the 75% probability of, of, of the 100 year flood value rather than the median estimate. There's ways of doing it that way. Or you can just say, we're going to take this value and allow for this additional margin of error in terms of number of feet above the floodplain. So there are ways of dealing with it. And in fact, Atlas 14 folks are not ignorant of this of the issue. They're, they're collaborating with scientists right now at Penn State and a couple other places to, to figure out what would be a good way of, um, of, of, of using non-stationary estimates and a new, good methodology for that. And lastly, I've seen some draft legislation which would actually commission National Academy of Sciences to study this in detail and then require NOAA to develop the and implement the methodology for, for dealing with the changing rainfall risk over time. So then, then they also want to, want to know, do you think we should move towards regulating the 500 year floodplain versus the 100 year floodplain? Well, for um, the, you know, the The 100 year floodplain um, is treated in a binary way. That's how floodplains work, basically. You say, okay, here your risk is, is, is too high, here it's okay, um, which is kind of weird because risk is continuous. And in fact, um, I think people underestimate flood risk because of those terminologies. If you're inside the 100 year floodplain, you have, you have a greater than one in a hundred risk of flooding any given year. Uh, if you're just outside of it, your risk is uh, just slightly less than one in 100. Um, so does that, saying 500 year floodplain can make sense if, if you, that's another way of adding an additional margin of error. Um, if we're talking about the high meter floodplains as estimated by no Atlas 14, which are assuming no climate change. It's another way of adding a margin of error. And it sort of worked out well for places like Houston and Austin because the old 500 year floodplains are actually fairly close to what the new 100 year floodplains are gonna be based upon how much the estimates have changed there. Um, but, um, you know, on a more deeper level, the, the question is, what sort of risk do we want to accept as a society for our infrastructure, for our homes and so forth? And for that matter, what sort of risk do insurance companies want to be willing to pay for? And an unfortunate consequence of climate change is on the one hand, risks go up, but on the other hand, it becomes harder to understand what those risks are and put a number to them because our future risk depends upon What's going to be in the atmosphere? How sensitive is the climate system to that? How much does that climate change imply for changes in a particular location? And how we deal with those broad uncertainties is a sort of a risk on top of a risk on top of a risk thing, which um, is really a bear to deal with. And, and yeah, good luck to us for that. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for a lot of interesting uh, things. You definitely uh, shed some light on for us. So uh, before I get um, onto the next little part of our presentation, just want to talk about what's coming up next. Do you have any concluding thoughts that you wanted to share with us? Or do you think you kind of covered everything you wanted to cover? No, I think we're good. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for your time and for giving us this great presentation. I definitely learned a lot. Um, so what we have coming up next here is... Um, we actually have a presentation today at 1 p.m. So uh, Carolyn Ask with the uh, City of College Station, she's the Environmental Compliance, um, Environmental Compliance and Recycling Manager. She's gonna give a talk to us about uh, recycling in College Station. 
Um, and then also later tonight at 6 p.m., uh, the interns are going to be giving a presentation. They're going to watch the quick documentary story of stuff. It's about a 10 minute documentary. They're going to have a discussion around that. So that should be fun. Please join us for that uh, tonight. So we hope, definitely hope we see you back at one and we hope we see you back at six. Hope you all have a great day. And again, thank you so much, Dr. John Nielsen Gammon. Appreciated your talk and learning from you and everyone. Uh, oh, and I guess one last thing. Sorry, uh, there was a code word today. And I did put that in the chat, uh, but the code word is climatologist. Um, so just uh, keep track of that if you're trying to get those prizes. So again, thank you all everyone. Y'all everyone take care and stay safe. Okay.